Romans 1.20 tells us that God's power and divinity are obvious through what has been made, and skeptics are without excuse for their unbelief. Yet secular philosophies like evolution persist all over the culture. During the next half hour, John Stone Street addresses the wonder and truth of God's creation with filmmaker Steve Grison on this all new edition of Breakpoint This Week. The Chuck Colson Center for Christian Worldview. This is Breakpoint This Week with John Stone Street. Your school science textbook might have told you the universe is just the result of random chance, but God's magnificent design is obvious everywhere nonetheless. Here are John and guests to underscore that fact. Well, when Christians think about the world around them and the creation, uh, we often think of it now in terms of creation versus evolution. Since Charles Darwin wrote that book, Origin of Species, back in the end of the 1800s, a lot of the conversation has become about how did God create the world? Did he create the world? How actively was he involved in it? And that sort of thing. It's led to high profile debates and a lot of books and a lot of conversation. Well, how can parents and teachers and uh, mentors and leaders point the next generation to believing the truth that we read in the first couple chapters of Genesis, that God is the creator of the world and that he has designed things in a brilliant way? I'm thrilled to bring on the program my friend Steve Grison, who has given us a terrific resource, a new film that he's produced called The Master Designer, The Song, and it is a beautifully filmed Great music, great score, well narrated, and a factual piece on the brilliance that we see all around us. I watched it with my kids not too long ago, and they absolutely loved it. Steve, great to have you on Breakpoint this week. Thanks, John. My pleasure. Talk a little bit about kind of the vision of the master designer, the song, what you were trying to communicate. Well, you know, it's interesting. I was always raised with animals in my life. I was raised in Asia. And my parents were missionaries there for 30 years. And I grew up always around animals. And I have sort of had this theme all through my life where I just sort of embraced and loved the creation around us. And little did I know that later in my life I'd get involved in doing a series of films that would really start affecting culture. We started out with a series called Incredible Creatures That Defy Evolution. And we ended up having over 400,000 reviews on Netflix when they shared on Netflix. And over 2 million people visit our YouTube channel. And we really touched a nerve here because I think what's interesting about this whole discussion is that the basic concept behind science is this grand idea that the world is orderly, that it's all been ordered. And of course, this was put forward by the Hebrews who said that God had created and held the world together in, in, in his order. And it was really that assumption that drove all the founders of early science. How do we uncover and discover the order that's been imposed on the world? So that was sort of my big idea as I approached this series. Because really the series looks at the question of where is design now being shown all through nature? And even science now is acknowledging that so much of what we are observing clearly points to design. Now they're not willing to go with who the designer is, but that becomes the big discussion to look at this amazing design that's been placed in nature around us and drill down. And the animals are one of the best ways to do it, the most interesting ways to do it. Let's talk about some of these stories, because they are great stories. You talk about wolves, you talk about bison, you talk about bees. Tell you what, let's start with the bees. What did you learn about the bees in filming this? Well, the bees were a great opening to the show, because there's so much about bees that people know are amazing. What we tried to do was, we, in the storytelling model that we used, we connected these creatures to these interesting points of history. And we connect the bees to a great story about George Washington, how bees literally saved America, and that's an unknown story. But as we get into the whole design of the bees, it's incredible because they're just masters at so many things. For instance, it, you know, it takes 556 bees flying 55,000 miles to gather nectar from 2 million flowers to give us one pound of honey that we enjoy on our table. Amazing. You know, the queen bee lays 200,000 eggs a year. And the bees communicate with this thing called pheromones in the hive, where they pass on these chemicals back and forth to each other. And when that report reaches the queen, 
she knows everything about the hive, and so she may lay more worker bees next round or whatever. So it's an, they're amazing at so many levels. They're mathematicians. They build these six-sided polygons called hexagons, which is this really interesting geometric shape, but it's not easy to build because two sides are even, and unless you build this absolutely perfectly, they could never network this whole hive together the way it's done. And these cells that they create hold the most amount of honey that math can produce. And a triangle wouldn't work, a square wouldn't work. And they're angled 9 to 14 degrees toward the center of the hive. So if they fill it up with honey, the honey doesn't run out. Mm-hmm. They're also these amazing dancers. And they use two dances, which science now has figured out what's behind it. They do a thing called a round dance and a figure eight dance or a waggle dance. And these two dances essentially become... GPS coordinates now, they've deciphered how the dances work. And these dances provide GPS coordinates to the other bees as to where the location of good flowers are. And they can fly directly to the spot where the good food is and bring it back to the hive. Just absolutely remarkable. Well, Steve, like you said, in in this film, you do a really interesting thing because you talk about these kind of intricate designs of the animals themselves and what the animals are able to do, but also how this design kind of contributed to these kind of a larger story. So, you know, the connection between, you know, George Washington and the Revolutionary Army and the bees, you also connect just the bison and how the, this herd of animals sustained Native Americans for so long. Talk a little bit about the bison. You know, the bison are so interesting because they really were this sort of gift from heaven to the Native American people. I mean, it was, it was sort of this this Walmart, this treasure trove of resources, because it not only provided food to the Native Americans, but they used the horns for scoops or spoons. And the hide they used, uh, of course, the head they used as a bowl. Even the heart was used to carry dried meat. And um, it just went on and on about all the uses for cooking vessels and tools that were created because of the richness of this one animal. So we wanted to sort of honor this connection between the Native people in America and this animal, and we sort of set that up and create this Native American scene that happens before horses came to America. They were brought by Cortez. So everything was hunted on foot. There were no fabrics. And we literally had to create this scene where everything was made out of skins. We bought deer hides and literally had dresses sewn and beaded. And so people, it's an amazing amount of work that will go into a production like this. This is why it took three years, by the way. But, you know, the bison has got this remarkable system of being four stomachs. And it's not the only animal that has these four stomachs. But this particular system is so efficient at processing limited food supplies. They live on the plains of America. And a lot of times they eat these sort of woody, rugged sources of food when there's not sort of abundant spring or summer grasses. And with this remarkable kind of conveyor belt four stomach system that they have, that food is able to move from one stomach into the next, into the next. And each stomach does a different thing to extract every bit of nutrition out of these relatively low nutrition food sources. And so you have this remarkable ability that sustains this animal that is an enormous animal, sometimes 2,500 pounds. And what's a remarkable, I think, in the American legend and folklore was, you know, bison at one time were, they said as many as 90 million of them roamed the plains of America. It was in a massive herd. And then everybody knows that they were almost had gone extinct. They were hunted, but more than even hunting, because they looked at all those numbers, uh, brucellosis, which is a wasting disease, killed a huge number of them as well. And remarkable, they got down to just 551 animals left in America from 90 million. Quite remarkable. And then they restored from a few animals. Yellowstone started a program, and the herds have now come back. It can be seen all over North America again. So it's a very beautiful American story in a way. And we tried to really honor the Native history and the Native people. And we point out one very interesting thing at the end of the bison. And that is, how does a warrior on foot with a bow and a small spear take down an animal that's 2,500 pounds when he may be only 150 pounds? How does that happen? And we discovered this remarkable design that was put into the animal that gave the Indian an advantage. And that was all the other animals or the mammals in the world have what's called a 
pleural lung cavity. We're that way. We have two lungs left and right. So if you punctured one of those lungs, you would have one lung that collapsed, but you could still breathe. But that's not true with the bison. They have a singular lung cavity. So it's perfect for hunting. One well-placed arrow or spear, like a tiny nail in a tire, can cause it to lose all of its lung capacity, collapsing and killing the giant beast. Now, there's no evolutionary advantage to this. And a lot of these animal designs challenge a lot of the evolutionary ideas and assumptions that are out there. But it's a remarkable story, and, and it's, a, it's a beautiful story. Again, the film title is The Master Designer, The Song, and we're talking with the producer of the film, Steve Grison. Uh, Steve, you know, you're, you're talking a lot of scientific detail here, and uh, I, I know you're well enough to spill the beans here and say you don't have a PhD in any of the sciences. So how are you careful to make sure that the information you were conveying in the film was actually accurate? In this particular series, I have a fantastic scientific team that has been working with us since the very beginning. These guys are all absolutely the tops in their fields in the U.S. And these guys were all a tremendous help to me. So we right. wanted to get it right. We were very careful about that. When I watched that segment on the cricket and the, and the song of the cricket, I was blown away. And it, there's a sense of wonder that's created. Really, the goal here is more than just, you know, well, evolution's false and there's been a creator and so on and so on. I mean, you're really trying to bring people to kind of a sense of worship here, aren't you? I really am, because I think at the core of all this is the more we drill down, the more science information that we get, the more it will reveal about our creator and the incredible master design that he put into this world that we enjoy. And I think for a lot of people, nature speaks to our soul in a very deep way. I mean, why is it that we're at peace when we go out into a walk in the woods and we enjoy the beauty around us? What is it that touches us that deeply? And I think in a lot of ways, music does a similar thing. And that's what the cricket brought to us. We talk about this remarkable connection that the Chinese had in growing up in Asia. I was aware of this to crickets. They've collected them for years and keep these little cages of crickets in their homes to enjoy the song. They seem to be the only culture in the world that sort of dialed this in. And in fact, it goes back to the Tang Dynasty. They used to listen to the cricket song. I remember this was long before there was any sort of timepieces, but they would listen to the cricket song and the cricket song would change and tell them when to plant. They would also warn them when the cold weather was coming and how to knit warm clothes for the cold weather. But I found this interesting recording, an audio engineer down in Santa Fe, New Mexico, had done this recording of crickets in his backyard. And he began to wonder, you know, the cricket song is a very set of very high frequencies. Many of these frequencies we can't really hear at all. So he began to wonder what would happen if he slowed the frequencies down so that the frequencies would be in a range that we as humans could hear better. And really what we show in the film and what we're able to play back is this cricket song that sounds like an amazing choir. It's absolutely chilling to listen to, and I think that's what you were referring to, John. I think it's just, it sounds like a multi-part choir singing, and it gives you a sense of all creation sings, all creation worships its creator. And it's a beautiful story, the cricket chorus. The master designer of the song, you can find it at explorationfilms.com, and of course, we'll link to it at breakpoint.org. Click on the This Week tab, and uh, you'll find the link to it. And thanks for taking some time to explain it to us here on Breakpoint This Week. 